Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On tonight's episode, whoa, I check out a lost treasure. I'd like to get 75,000. Corey gets a blast from the past. Oh, yeah. Me and my brother would fight over the toy. Where are you going? Getting ready to go to L.A. And Chum gets a little groovy out in L.A. Yeah, baby! Hey, how can I help you? I have an ancient Roman military diploma. I love the Roman Empire. There's so many neat things to talk about. It was an amazing civilization and was in steep decline for like 100 years and then really, really just sort of fell off a cliff in the 400s. It was a really, really dangerous thing being the emperor of Rome. Julius Caesar was assassinated. Sort of a political Game of Thrones back then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here today to sell my ancient Roman military diploma. I'm a collector and dealer of Roman and Greek items from antiquity, and this is a piece that I picked up in my travels about two years ago. If I'm able to make a deal today, I'll probably use that money to buy another coin for my collection. Pretty cool. When you were in the Roman army, certain guys had their diplomas that they literally wore on their chest, and it was stitched into their fancy outfit. Day to day, they didn't wear it, but like if they, when they dressed up, they would literally put their diploma there and it says, I'm such and such rank, I you know, this is the units I belong to, blah, 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 blah. These things were two pieces, right? Originally came as two pieces, yes. It was hand engraved, so it's nearly 1,800 years old, for a soldier by the name of Marcus Aurelius Valens, who served in the Praetorian Guard. And the Praetorian Guard was an elite um, part of the army that basically served as bodyguards for the, the ruling Roman emperor. Basically, almost every soldier wanted to be in the Praetorian Guard, just due to the fact that you were based in Rome. I mean, these guys were sitting and drinking wine. So, how much you want for this? For a piece like that, I think I'd like to get $15,000 for it. All right, um, I mean, I think it's super cool, but I'm absolutely clueless on this. I've read about these in books, but I never saw a price. I don't know how to tell if they're real. Um, if you don't mind hanging out, I'm gonna call a guy who hopefully will know about this. And uh, I'll be right back. I'm totally fine with an expert coming in to authenticate and verify the diploma. I look forward to learning more about what it's worth and where it comes from. How you doing? Good, how are you? Pretty good. What do you have here? I have an autographed self-portrait done by Alfred Hitchcock. Check it out. What do you think? Does it look like in my profile? Gary. <laughs> I have an Alfred Hitchcock autographed self-portrait. I collect Hollywood memorabilia, and there was a celebrity auction going on, and this was one of the couple that I purchased. Now I would like to sell it to expand my baseball autograph collection. This is pretty cool. Um... The silhouette is known from his TV series, Alfred Hitchcock Presents. And it would be a silhouette of him, and then the camera would be focused on it. He would walk into it like this, and the silhouette would like line up with his face, and it would disappear. Then he would be standing here, you know. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, and that's where this silhouette comes from. So Alfred Hitchcock's a pretty fascinating character. Are you an Alfred Hitchcock fan? I am. I own all his movies, all his Alfred Hitchcock Presents episodes. What are the movies he did? He did Vertigo, North by Northwest, To Catch a Thief. To Catch a Thief, yeah. Rear Window. And then in 1960, he had his most shocking movie, Psycho. And it wasn't a big hit with the critics, but the fans loved it. You know, it was suspenseful, and it went on to be his biggest hit, kind of what he's mm -hmm. known for today. Master of Suspense. Yeah, you know, he's uh, obviously a little bit before my time, but nominated for five Academy Awards, three Emmys, just this bigger-than-life kind of guy at the time. Just had to get a closer look here. I've never seen his signature before in person. I've seen pictures of it before. How much are you asking for this? Uh, $3,000. OK. Um, you know, it very well could be worth that. I don't know. I can't verify this, though, and I'm definitely not going to be able to pay you $3,000 unless I have someone come down and take a Absolutely. look at it. All right, give me a few minutes. Terrific. I feel that this autograph is 100% legitimate, and I would welcome 
an outside expert to come in and examine it. Hey, how's it going? Hi, how are you? I'm doing good. What do we got? I have an unused 1961 Sugar Smack cereal box. All right. That's Quick Draw McGraw, right? Yes. What's that one? Huckleberry Hound. Huckleberry Hound. It was simple advertising. If you bring a kid down a cereal aisle and he sees his favorite cartoon character on a box of cereal, that's the box of cereal he wants. That's what got me when I was a kid. The toys that were inside, that's what really prompted me. Oh, yeah. And me and my brother would fight over the toy. <laughs> I have this cereal box because I'm a collector of Hanna-Barbera items. I collect many things from Hanna-Barbera, including lunch boxes, cereal boxes, toys. I've had this cereal box for 15, 20 years. There's no sentimental value to me. It's just another thing that I collected. This is really cool. Kellogg's is a really, really strange and interesting company. There was John and William Kellogg. Eventually, the brothers split up. William was more interested in making money and selling cereal. He came up with the idea to start marketing more to kids. He's the one that started putting sugar in cereals, putting cartoon characters on there. You know, Tony the Tiger. You know, those were ideas that he came up with. So I just don't understand how you get an unused cereal box. <laughs> well, what it is, is I think it's called a flat. It's usually from an advertising agency who made it, and they keep a sample of it. OK. So what else do you know about it? It's printed 1961. OK. It's pretty collectible. There's a pretty big market for uh, cereal box collectors. It's also Hanna-Barbera collectors. Yeah. So what are you looking to do with it? Sell it. How much are you looking to get? $500. OK. Um... Five hundred dollars. This really isn't my game here, man. Um, would you take a hundred? No. What's the lowest you'll go? Four hundred dollars. These things go for six, seven, eight hundred dollars easily. Well, my man, unfortunately, it don't look like we're gonna make a deal. Hopefully, you can find one of those six hundred dollar people for it. <laughs> Thank you. I plan on putting the cereal box back in my collection. Hundred dollars is way too low. He really flaked out on the price. Hey, how's it going? How are you? Pretty good. And it's a sword. It is a sword, but not just a regular sword. It's a special sword. What makes it so special? This was a King George corset sword, which is very rare, and it dates from around 1780. So this could have been a Revolutionary War sword. Guy definitely had a smaller hand than me, because yep. I can't even get my hand through this. My hand won't fit on it. <laughs> yeah. I have a King George III era corset sword. I am a collector, and I'm passionate about military weapons, and especially swords. I am asking for $5,900. If I'm able to make a sale today, I would like to take my wife for a European vacation. That's cool. For an officer in the Navy or the Army, one of the most important things when you went out was, was your sword. It had to be cool. This was a nice sword. You know, yeah. it wasn't the super rich, but it was definitely an officer's sword. You have the royal cipher right here, and we got like, these gold inlays like it, that. Sure. Look at the horse head. Look at the teeth on that horse bed. This is, looks like it to be bronze, this right here. What I really am impressed with is his bluing right here. Sure. Um, it takes a really good swordsmith to create bluing well enough the last couple hundred years. Sure. It's short, very short, as a matter of fact. How much do you want for it? I'm looking for $5,900. It's interesting. Um, I'm sort of puzzled why it's so small. But the horse head, um, I know it's desirable. There's not a whole lot of them out there. So I, I'd really like to call in Alex. He's my go-to guy for just about everything military. And he can tell us if we have a Revolutionary War sword here and answer a bunch of other questions. So give me a few minutes. Sure, thank you. So I've been doing this for a long time, but I do not know everything. So I'm happy to learn what the expert has to say.
There's a guy in the shop and he has a horse head sword dating back to the Revolutionary War. I would love to get my hands on this thing. Just about any weapon from the Revolutionary War could be worth a lot of money. But before I can cut a deal on this thing, I'm gonna call up Alex. He's my expert on military antiques. He's gonna give me the scoop on it. Well, here's the little sword I told you about on the phone. Yeah, it's cute. It just seems odd to me being so short. And also, I have no idea what this thing's worth. Okay. Can I pick it up? Sorry. Okay. Sure. Oh. It is a British late 18th century military issue horse head cutlass. Okay. Typically, horse heads were for cavalry or for land soldiers, not for naval soldiers. This chain guard really takes it away from the sense of a combat sword and more into the dress sword type of thing. Blingy. Blingy. Perfect. <laughs> that's GR for George Rex. Rex is king in Latin, so it's George the uh, Third. And then on the back, you have the lion and the unicorn and the British coat of arms. OK. Well, it wasn't the Revolutionary War at all. No, but it dates from about the Revolutionary War or early Napoleonic Wars. But there's a lot to like about this sword. Horse heads are rare, and they are sought after in the collector's market. This one in particular is pretty well detailed. The only thing that really sort of sticks out for me, this indentation that runs along the blade is called a fuller. Typically, a fuller is designed in the blade and ends a few inches before the end. This fuller, there's not a border here. My feeling is this sword was shortened by a few inches. So in value terms, it does impact it. So what do you think it's worth? I think if it were the full length, it would be in the $5,000 or $6,000-ish range. Based on how it is here, I think a retail value is $3,500. OK. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So all that said, what do you want for it? $3,300. Give me two grand. I, I, it's a fair price. I, I, I'll go 2300 can't do it. If it, we had the rest of the blade here, you would have the rest of your money. My, my absolute best price is $2,800. Okay. And, and I, All right, it, so $2,350? No, $2,800. I mean, I, I, I I'm not going to go any more than that. And I, I, can't, I can't do it. All right, well, maybe next time. Next time. All right. Thank you. Change your mind. Come and see me. OK, thank you. Really, I would have paid the rest of the money if I had the rest of the sword. I have a customer in the shop with what he says is a self-portrait autograph by Alfred Hitchcock. He's asking $3,000 for it. I'm not sure if he's psycho on the price, so I'm having Steve come down to take a look at it. How's it going? Good, how are you? Good, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Scary. How you doing? <laughs> nice to see you, Thanks man. for coming out. This is what I called you about. Yeah. It's really cool. It has a silhouette there. I don't know too much about Alfred Hitchcock. Really one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. You look back at the films he made, he always had that suspenseful, anxiety-type filming. And it still stands the test of time, because a lot of filmmakers still follow kind of his model, his theory. So it's really quite amazing. So your concerns? Well. My concerns are, obviously, is this autograph real? And you know, I also want to know, is the silhouette a constant in his signature? Or is that kind of like a special thing to have? It would vary. He would do it sometimes for special people, maybe a special friend. Did he do it all the time? No. Does it add more to the signature? Yes. But my biggest concern is with stuff like this, is it printed? Or is it actually a, you know live ink on there? And that's something we need to take a look at to start off with. OK. And, you know, almost immediately I could tell he's using a uh, fiber tip marker, I believe, on, yeah, that, that's what we're looking at here. Um, obviously, the next thing I want to do, you know, I was looking at an example of the signature and kind of how he signed his name and did his thing on here. So the thing I love about his autograph is he had this defining moment for his A. Yeah. Always. He'd start off here and he'd lead right into it. Ironically enough, his last name, Hitchcock, but he has a nice little hitch here and he just flows right into it. And there's no doubt about it. Ink is live, caricature is great. I have no doubt that he did that. Signature looks absolutely magnificent. Steve, I'm in suspense here. Uh, Tell me how much. <laughs> uh, put the value right at $1,200. 
Okay, perfect. Well, not exactly what you were looking for, but uh, I appreciate you coming yeah, good by. Good to see you, chum. I know you're asking for three thousand. Um, I've seen them uh, recently selling as high as seventy-five hundred dollars. Okay. What's your bottom price on it? Twenty-five hundred would be my bottom line. I've got to believe what my man Steve Grad says. Mm -hmm. uh, with him telling me this is worth twelve hundred, you know, I'd be a buyer at about six hundred. No, I think I'll take it. Take it with me. Okay. Well, thanks for coming in. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Thanks again. Thank you. I came in looking for three thousand dollars. They offered me six hundred dollars. That's psycho. Well. What's up, guys? What's up, man? What are you doing? Getting ready to go to LA. You didn't apply for vacation time or anything like that. It's not vacation time. I'm going. I got a lead on an item. I'm going to check out, baby. W what do you mean you're gonna go check something out, baby? I got a groovy item. If I can get it for a good price, maybe we can sell it for one million dollars. So what? you're taking a vacation and you just you're trying to trick me into paying for it? No, I'm here to tell you guys because I need you to give me a couple blank checks. What's so funny? I got something lined up. It's going to be groovy, baby. What does that even mean? Zip it. What are you doing? No, zip, zip, zip it. What, zip, what? Zip, zip, zip it. Keep going. Zippy long stocking. Zip it. Go ahead. Zip Keep it. going. Zip. <laughs> Zip. You better Zip. run. You better run to L.A. right now. Chop. Chop. What items are you looking at in California, supposedly? I'm looking at a movie prop. Okay. And how long are you going to be gone? Um, this is a day trip. You know what? Go down. There, do what you're going to do. I will not give you two blank checks. But if you do buy something, I will arrange payment. Have a little bit of fun, but this is remember, this is a business trip. Get right back, OK? I'm going to have a little fun. I'm going to take sharks and put little laser beams on their head. What? I got a guy in the shop, and he's got an ancient military diploma, and he says it's right around 1,800 years old. I don't know anything about this, but I know a guy who does, Dave Baggy. So I got him coming down to the shop, and he's going to figure this out for me. Hey, Dave, what's up? Hey, hi, Rick. How you doing, man? Doing good. Here is the diploma. Yeah. I had to run <laughs> when I heard about this. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's really cool. Uh, you know, I've seen these in books. That's it. Right. There are a lot of different Roman inscriptions. The most, probably the most common surviving is from Roman military diplomas. They're usually fragmentary like this. So the original would have been larger like this, and then one similarly large piece, and they would have put, been put together like a sandwich. And the idea was that they had the official inscription, which could be used to explain the terms of service and the fact that this person was now a citizen. OK. Has this one been studied? It has been studied. It was published in Roxana's uh, Roman military publication. OK. So if this one is, is published in that, that's a very good thing. OK. It's more complete than usual. Quite often, this is something this size is all that survives. So this is a relatively complete piece. He's, he served with Praetorian cohort, uh, which, of course, is very famous. They are among the more common uh, diplomas. There are perhaps a 100 of them known in fragments and, and larger pieces. But these things are still rare. They're still very rare. OK, so what's it worth? It's very hard to put a precise value on an item like this. Um, being the two pieces relatively complete, I think $12,500 for a collector would be about right. OK. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate it. All right, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so, um, so what would you take for it? Well, I'd really like to get $15,000 for it. I think it's something that would perform really well at auction. I mean, I imagine this is a very specialized market. So I, I'd give you like six grand. Mm. 
I would consider taking less. How's 12,500? Uh, no. <laughs> Um, no, I mean, I, I, I have to resell. I have to make money. I mean, it's just the, the matter of business. I mean, I'll go like 6,500. I think I, I think I paid more for that, so I, it might have to stay in my collection. Okay, well, I guess the die is cast. <laughs> have a nice day. Thank you very much. For now, I'll keep the diploma in my collection until I find the right buyer. I'm headed out to LA. I heard about this awesome prop house that has the cryogenic freezing machine from Austin Powers movie. I had to come check it out. Maybe I can buy it, put Rick into it, and send him to the future. Hello, is Harvey here? I am. How you doing, Harvey? Chum Lee. Hey, Chum Lee, welcome. I'm here about the um, Austin Powers prop. All right, it's way in the back. Let's take a walk. And here we are. This is the famous. Austin Powers cryogenic chamber. Shagadelic, baby. Yeah. This is my prop house. It's called 20th Century Props. And we have here the Austin Powers cryogenic chamber that came directly from the movie. So I'm looking to get $8,500 for it. This is really cool. I still remember this in the beginning of the movie. Austin Powers wanted to freeze himself so that when Dr. Evil, his arch nemesis, resurfaced, to do evil on the world, he would be there to stop him. Fun. Did you ever see the movie? No. <laughs> no. Pretty good movie. Basically, it was a parody of the old James Bond movies where Mike Myers played Austin Powers, the good guy, and he played Dr. Evil. Really, really funny. They had some iconic scenes in it. Spun off two more sequels. And still to this day, people are watching Austin Powers and they're saying the lines like, you know, yeah, baby, and shagadelic. So where did you get it? Um, I purchased this uh, directly from the movie at the end. A lot of the decorators are really cool, and they'd like to see their piece live on. Yeah. It's a cryogenic chamber. I mean, it's supposed to bring you into the future. Why not let it live <laughs> on? Right. Which chamber was this one? Was this the Austin Powers chamber? This is the Austin Powers chamber. I'm going to take a walk around it. And okay. It looks like it opens up. Have you ever been inside of it? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so how much are you looking to get for it? I'm looking for about $8,500. Um, well, going over it right off the top, I noticed it's missing the Austin Powers nameplate up there. I know it's got a little wear and tear on it, but I mean, it's from 1997, so you'd think it would. It's it a might lot have of years. A, might have a chip here and there. You know, I'm at a loss for words on how much I could pay for this. If you don't mind, I'll have a buddy of mine come down. You might even know him, I don't know, he's tall Rob. Oh, he's, Rob. You do know him? Yeah. Okay, yeah, he's, uh, he's a friend of mine and he helps me out with all these movie props and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, do you mind if I call him and see if I can get him down here? Nope, don't, don't mind at all. All right, give me just a few minutes. Hey, how can I help you? I'd like to show you this thing here and... Okay, and this is... A, uh... Sketch of Superman. Superman. You know, I've actually been confused for this guy once or twice, though. <laughs> I'm, I'm here at the pawn shop today to sell my signed Superman artwork. I acquired it from a friend of mine that I've known for over 30 years. I traded some merchandise for it, and uh, it, I thought it was a good investment. Pretty cool. Uh, we have signatures from Joe Schuster and Jerry Siegel. They're the ones who created Superman mm -hmm. and basically came up with this comic strip. Mm -hmm. um, Superman became a really big success. It's up until like World War II. After World War II, the style of comics changed a little bit. And uh, by this time, uh, they put him in the number one action comics. I don't know if it's the most expensive comic book ever sold, but I'm sure it's close. But then there were some Superman movies, then there was a Superman TV series, and it really revived it. So, uh, yeah, he just he's part of the American culture now. Okay, is this taped on there or glued on there? Um, you know what? Uh, I don't really know. If you need to pull it apart, we should... Well, I'm not gonna pull it apart, it might rip. Um, I'm sure it's gonna affect the value somehow or the other. How much are you looking to get out of this? 6,500. 6,500. I mean, the signatures themselves, I know, have to be worth something. But I have no idea if this is original artwork. I'm just not 
exactly a comic book expert. Let me have someone look at it, and I'll go from there. Very interested to find out what they say. OK. If you can hang out a little bit, I'll get them down here, and uh, we'll go from there. Okie doke. I was always much bigger on Batman. I'm here in LA at a prop house, and I'm taking a look at the cryogenic freezer from the first Austin Powers movie. The prop's really cool, but the seller's asking $8,500, but I'm not so sure the price is so groovy, baby. So I called tall Rob down to come take a look at it. You're looking pretty good inside that thing. Hey. Harvey, how are you? Nice hey, to see Rob. you again. <laughs> All right, Chubbly, come on out. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, baby. <laughs> oh. All right. Oh. There you go. Thanks for coming out. Of course. This is uh, quite cool. No, it's shagadelic. <laughs> oh, my bad. You're right. Yeah, well, this was the cryogenic chamber that they used in the film. This is what we call uh, a foreground prop. This is one that he actually stood in was filmed in, started the film, actually. It was the beginning of the film. I'll tell you that Austin Powers, in particular, highly collectible props that come from those films. Yeah, it's a cult classic, I think. Like, everyone who's my age grew up to the movie, and they love it. Right. So the big question, what kind of value does it have? It has some serious condition issues. The ice glass is not in great shape. It has cracks, it's broken throughout. Overall, it's average condition at best. Because of the size, it limits who's going to purchase this. You can't really put this in your living room. Tough for the shop, even, because of its size. Taking all of those things we talked about into consideration, you're looking somewhere around $3,500. OK. Well, I appreciate it. As always, Chumley, good to you. see you. Thank you. Good to see you again. You too. All right, we'll you see too. you again soon, I hope. OK. All right, be well. Thanks. You're welcome. Well, you heard what Rob had to say. Um, has your price changed? Well, I was asking 85, but I would come down to 55 for you. You know, I think I'm going to have to pass on it. I realize it's a lot bigger than I thought, mm. and I probably would have to spend $500 just to ship it back to Vegas. It's literally one of the coolest things I've ever seen, but I don't think we're going to be able to make a deal today. Oh. Oh, sorry it. to hear that. Okay. Let me uh, escort you out. Oh, um, is that the boot? That's the boot. <laughs> People all over the world love comic book superheroes. Over 130,000 costume wearing fanatics take over Comic Con in San Diego every year. So, how did this worldwide fascination with superheroes come to be? The word hero comes from the ancient Greek language, and the Greeks had tons of them. Achilles, Zeus, Odysseus, these were the original OG heroes. The first comics as we know them came out in newspapers a couple hundred years ago, and they were mostly political satire. These satires paved the way for comic books and eventually superheroes. But it's not until 1938 that Action Comics introduces us to a flying alien with superhuman strength in a spandex suit. His name, Superman. And the golden age of comic books is born. In the 1940s, 1.5 million comic books were flying off the shelves every month. These days, superheroes sell mostly on the big screen. In 2017, Marvel superhero movies grossed $2.5 billion worldwide. Believe me, I get it. When I was a kid, I dreamed of being Batman. Bruce Wayne had the Batmobile, the gadgets, and the mystique. He was just cooler than the rest of them. Reminds you of somebody? <laughs>So I've got a guy in the shop. He's got a signed Superman sketch. Now, this is an original drawing. This could be worth a fortune. So I've called in Paul, my comic book guy, just to make sure this thing's not kryptonite. Hey, man, what's up? Hey, how are you, Rick? Right oh, pretty good. Wow. Faster than a speeding bullet. Ben Steele in his bare hands. Truth, Ooh. justice in the American way. And it's signed nice. Joe Schuster, Jerry Siegel, they were two boys from Cleveland, Ohio. They went to New York City. Joe and Jerry sold their their creation, Superman, to DC Comics, you know, and 
the rest of their lives they spent trying to get the rights back. All right, so now the signatures I know are real. We got, we got some art here, and I don't know the deal with the art. So this is a really early version of Superman um, when he first was appeared in Action 1. But this is not the original art. This is a print made by uh, Schuster. Uh, the original, which is pen and ink, was sold on Heritage Auctions in 2003 for 7200 Is there something special about this print? So this is more something that probably he had when he was doing signings. So what do you think it's worth, just the way it is with the, with the original signatures? OK, uh, so maybe $1,000. OK. All Thanks, right. man. You got it. Take care. Take care. It's nice to meet you. Thank you. All right, so um, we now know why the one sold for a lot more money, because that was the original and this is not. He says I can get 1000 bucks out of it, so I'll give you $600. Well, I uh, appreciate the offer, but uh, I'm going to have to respectfully decline. <laughs> well, what will you take for it? Well, probably 4200 <laughs> Well, you can have it a very nice day. Because <laughs> at $4,200, this is kryptonite. <laughs> I... <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, we did not come up with a deal. I'm uh, disappointed, but uh, it, it, you know, it is what, what it is. Hey, what's going on? Hey. I brought you a really rare piece today from the oh. Desert Inn Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada. This is a miniature roulette table from the Desert Inn Hotel. Does it work? It works. All right. 22 black. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Oh. Oh, we got zero? No, 28. No, <laughs> next to zero. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, and that's the story of gambling. <laughs> I'm here today to offer my little miniature roulette table. It was made back in the 50s. I saw the table, and I was fascinated by it. I hadn't seen one before, and I bought it at an antique show in Portland, Oregon. This is cool. The dozen men used to give this out to um people and they would also sell them. I think he sold them for like 25 bucks. They were more or less exclusive. This is what the Desert Inn did. We're it talking like, early 50s, so 25 yeah. bucks a lot of money. This is a pricey little table. These were expensive to make. Uh, it's pretty cool that you got the original uh, Desert Inn right here. Does this have a copyright on it? Yeah, 1954. OK. This is uh, a copy of the instructions that came with this because the legs come off, it comes apart tells you how to put it together. Um, as far as I'm concerned, roulette's a sucker's game. Just, I mean, it's a really self-explanatory, easy game to play. OK, well, let me, how many times do I got to tell you? They're all <laughs> sucker games. You're never yeah, going to win. The right. odds are always in the favor of the house. In the end, the house always wins. The odds are against you, but people still enjoy playing it. I've never enjoyed playing roulette. OK, th this, is, this is really it's cool. It's precision, I mean, it, it, yeah. I, I love it because it really is vintage Vegas. What are you looking to get out of it? I'd like to get $750. $750. I don't know enough about this thing. I'll tell you what, I'm going to go give Andy a call and see if he wants to come down and take a look at it. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I got a buddy who deals in all these antiques. He'll, he'll probably know more, more what it's worth. If you don't mind hanging out, um, yeah, give him a call. All right, I'll be right back. I got six kids. It's all the gambling I need to do. It's not like you're going to find me in the wind poker room at 3 AM grinding it out with the lifers. But I have lived in Vegas for a while, and I do know a little bit about gambling. Gambling is a worldwide phenomenon, and it's a lot older than the United States. Legal or not, it's just a part of who we are. I mean, we've been making bets since we were kids. I bet you won't eat that slug. I bet I'm faster than you. I bet you'll never star in your own TV show. <laughs> well, clearly, I won that one. So where did our worldwide fascination with such a risky business come from? It turns out even the Greek gods had the gambler's itch. In Greek mythology, Hades, Poseidon, and Zeus actually played dice to divvy up the universe. Now that's a high stakes game. In 1638, Il Rodotto opens up in Venice, Italy at the start of their spring carnival. Why open it during the spring carnival? Because if everyone's partying, everyone's happy, everyone's gambling, everyone's losing money. 
It's basically the business model for every casino ever since. In the United States, we've always had this love-hate relationship with gambling. In 1910, it was basically illegal all around the country. So why was gambling legalized in Nevada in 1932? Plain and simple, we had a full-blown depression, and we needed the money. And almost a century later, gambling is a $400 billion industry worldwide. These days, it's easy as ever to make a bet. Just make sure you leave a little bit for the mortgage. Can you color me up? Hello, what can I help you with? This is a golden coral rosary from a famous shipwreck, the 1715 fleet. That's cool. Coral was really, really popular and inexpensive around this time period because they realized that you could take a few cannons and start blasting coral reefs. They weren't exactly environmentally friendly back then, <laughs> okay? I buy and sell relics and artifacts from different famous shipwreck sites. And I got this particular piece almost a year ago from one of my colleagues. If I sell this rosary today, I would use the funds to buy the golden box that this particular rosary was found in. This is really cool. So this was from the 1715? Um... Fleet. OK. Treasure was the hottest thing on the market 20 years ago. Some royal coins from the shipwreck 1715 fleet went for 275,000 apiece. But not everything they found has that kind of value. By 1700, thousands and thousands of ships were going back and forth from the New World. Back then, you would never sail the Atlantic between like June and November. Those were the months with the hurricanes. But Spain said, we don't give a damn. And there has been a fleet of ships that needed to bring as much gold and supplies as they could back to Spain. And they ended up wrecking off the coast of Florida. So how much do you want for this? I'd like to get 75000 <sighs> If you had this in, like, 1987, you could have got $150,000 for it. And that's because there was hardly any shipwrecks found. But nowadays, they're constantly finding new shipwrecks. The market is flooded with treasure. I mean, I'd give you, like, 12 grand for it. Yeah, I couldn't do that. Um, come down to, like, 48. I mean, literally, my highest price would be 13 grand. Ugh, you're it's killing me. Well, thanks for looking at it. OK. I appreciate that. All right, well, have a good one. OK. Change your mind, give me a call. OK, will do. Yeah, I didn't think that ship would ever sell. <laughs> so I got a customer in the shop, and they have a miniature roulette wheel from Wilbur Clark's Desert Inn Casino. It's really cool, but before I take a gamble on this thing, I'm gonna call up Andy. He's my vintage Vegas expert. Hopefully, he can figure this out for me. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. How you been? Always good. good How's it going? You, Rick. Is uh, this it? This is what you called me about, I'm assuming. Um, we got a Wilbur Clark's Desert Inn mini roulette table. Yes, what do you think of um, fabulous vintage Vegas? I, I love vintage Vegas. I'm a nerd for it. OK, so this is probably 1950s era, yes? Yeah. Th these are very cool items, because they used to sell these at the gift shops, and they would sometimes give them away on New Year's Eve, uh, usually to high rollers, because as you can tell, it's a, it's a well-made piece. And uh, it is, oh, look at that. It is great. You have the original ball. It is very rare you actually have the ball. That's usually the first thing people lose. So what do you think? I mean, it does look in pretty good shape for being this old. There's definitely some wear on it. Uh, you can tell where people have been putting their hands. There's some scuff marks here. I mean, that's to be expected, because uh, people didn't always use chips when they were playing with these at home. This pamphlet is very cool. It does add to the collector value as far as, like, if you're going to display it, you've got something cool to display it with and something fun to look at. So what will it retail for? It's a nice piece. It's not in bad shape. Uh, there definitely is a market for them. I think this one, as it is, uh, even with all you have here, I think you're looking at about $175 retail. OK, well, thanks, man. Yeah, my pleasure. Have a good day, guys.
So I think we're pretty far off from 750, man. Um, hey, what, what's your best price? Probably my best price on it is 550. I can do 125 bucks, man. That's not gonna do it. Well, if you ever change your mind, you know sure. where I'm at. All right, thank you. They only offered me $125, and I paid a lot more than that for it, so I couldn't sell it for that. Oh, Chum's back. What's up, guys? Hey. So how was the adventure in California? Did you buy this thing you were looking for? I wanted to. It was amazing, coolest thing ever, but it was like, it was huge. I would have needed a truck to bring it back. It was the cryogenic machine from Austin Powers. OK. It was pretty awesome. I got you guys a couple gifts. All uh, right. That's for you. What is it? It's a sushi burrito from California. What'd you get me? Ah. Oh. You brought me a sushi burrito you took a bite out of? Jeez, nothing gets past you. Well, forget about your burrito. Do you have a picture of this thing? Yeah, I got a picture right here. That's me standing inside of it. <laughs> pretty cool. That's actually pretty cool. I didn't make him an offer because part of the little, like, plexiglass was cracked, and it was really big. OK, at least you went down there, and I got some seashells by the seashore. He bought them. Why do you always have to be so damn grumpy? Because he took a bite out of a burrito. You know what? He got you something, OK? Say thank you. Yeah. No! Why are you so angry? I've never been given a half-eaten sushi burrito as a gift. Well, here, I'll make it easy for you. Now it's just half a sushi burrito. You know, we could use these as poker chips. Why that's... do I feel like I'm taking crazy pills right now? That's what they would have done on Gilligan's Island. Get... 